you messaged me that that's what you'd be playing this morning, and uh, I especially love that arrangement. So, And it suits us well as we prepare our hearts for a hard message in James chapter 4 as our preschool age children are dismissed for Children's Church. Our school age children are still with us for a few more weeks. We're glad that you are here. There's going to be an interesting thing that you learn about children this morning, and I would have loved to have known when I was a little kid, but um, it was something that I somehow missed, and uh, in fact, every little boy at least, maybe the girls won't appreciate it so much, but the boys with us will no doubt think that this is cool. Whoever said Christianity wasn't cool, (laughs) well, we'll find out. James chapter 4. This is a very important passage for us. Let's begin once more with a word of prayer before we move back into our text. Father, um, we thank you for the ministry of your word that you have given to us. It's power and its effect in our lives as we conform into the image of your Son. We thank you that it is perfect and without error and that it is consistent in its message, in what it reveals to us about your gospel message. Our need, being sinners worthy of death, to receive the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, credited to us by faith. Father, we know that that is the message of James, even as well. And having been given new life in our Lord Jesus Christ through that faith, Father, you have also given us grace as slaves of righteousness too. And where we have true salvation, there will also be fruit, even as we go out into the world. Father, we pray that we will respond to your word with joy. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. It has been, admittedly, quite some time since we've been in the book of James. And... When we broke, it was kind of an unfortunate place. I didn't expect to break. I thought I would get at least one more, one more sermon out of James before we broke for the Christmas break and then moved into some more holiday-specific, I suppose, messages fitting of the season and consistent with the significance of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I saw that as a daunting task at the same time, but ultimately... Uh, the Lord saw fit to bring our whole household sick, wasn't able to get here. Pastor Greg stood in for me, and then by then, it was going back to the book of James for one message, then preaching a few Christmas sermons, and then coming back again after a few weeks, and it just didn't seem like it would have fit nearly as well. But I'm glad it worked out this way, even though we've begun James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, then broke And now we're coming back into the middle of an important passage of Scripture after having already seemingly introduced ourselves to that subject. And yet, at the same time, as I continued to study the text, and then even more so after last Sunday was canceled because of the weather, uh, you might think that that clears up time, that just gives more thought and attention to the same passage, and then you get two in one Sunday. I got to notice that There's squalls on the mountain. That's usually when they close Mountain Road. So we'll just stay here the rest of the day in case any of you are worried about it. We won't need to go anywhere. But actually, as we begin now in James chapter 4, verse 4, a strong case can be made for the chapter to begin here. The chapter breaks, the verse breaks, are not inspired, we understand that. The text is inspired of God. They simply help us find where we are, follow an outline, and so on and so forth. But James changes his tone as he also introduces us to what is regarded as the central core passage and message in the book of James. And it's also been one of the most misunderstood, as has been the whole of the book of James. You remember how the book of James from chapter 1 forward has been abused and misused to advocate for a works-based righteousness, but we've laboriously laid out with attention 
the reality that James is actually demonstrating to us the complete impossibility that we meritoriously earn favor with God, but he assumes that we have been justified by faith alone. It's required in the book of James. And having assumed that we've already received righteousness by faith alone, he consistently appeals to the recipients of his letter, those Jews that are dispersed from the 12 tribes of Israel, Jewish believers, he calls them brothers. And as brothers in the Lord, having received righteousness by faith, then they ought to live in accordance with being made slaves of righteousness and no longer being slaves of sin. But now, now we introduce this again a little over a month ago. His tone changes and he declares in a terribly often misunderstood passage, you adulteresses. And when we get to the why, it has led many various religious groups and cults to misapply what James is saying. Some have said, James is saying that Christians ought not to be engaged in politics or the secular arena. Others have said that Christians shouldn't be involved in business because that's going to ultimately mean that you must inherently then um, engage in contracts or services to unbelievers and that is a kind of fellowship or, or adultery with the world. It's kind of friendship with the world. Others have said that this means that we really cannot engage with the world and have to isolate ourselves and protect ourselves from the world. Various people groups, I'll address that briefly in a moment, but others have also said that in addition to all these kinds of things, that the, the preeminent class of all peoples would live in monasteries and that would be the highest level of religious experience and that's not what James is getting at at all, actually. So, what does James mean when he says, in the strongest imaginable terms, and rather offensively, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose, he jealously desires a spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we ought to include here probably verse 7. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Strong message often misunderstood. But there are obscure and odd interpretations of that passage. We understand that. But even within, within what we might say are circles of Christianity, true Christianity, there are also gross misunderstandings of what James is alluding to in this passage. And therefore, we end up missing the, the address of the heart, the concern that he has for the heart. There are many who use what James says, especially in verse 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God as a justification to advocate for the idea of what Leland Riken puts it as Christian obscurantism? I like that word. But in other words, what, what he means by that is that as the arena of our world proceeds from bad to worse, we turn increasingly inward in favor of societal disengagement. And a great many cults have been born out of that idea that this is the Christian calling. As the world be, proceeds from bad to worse, the Christian community has been called to a societal disengagement. In reality, we often... We often take encouragement that we live in a country where we have not experienced much persecution as it relates to the gospel message because of our alleged 
Christian country or a country from a Christian worldview or a judicial system based on biblical principles and, and those kinds of things. But in reality, in reality, we have deserted much of those original ideas that defined our judicial system. And it's certainly not because anymore of a Christian country that we live in that we've escaped any kind of trouble or persecution in this life, but rather, I would submit to you that perhaps it's because we've kept our light under a bushel a bit too much. We're afraid to open our mouths and declare what is unjust to be unjust. We're de- we are afraid to open our mouths to declare the solution to the world and would rather just kind of smirk and consent to what the world says is the solution to the world's problems. Rather than administrating the gospel, we instead hide it, preserve it, protect it, keep it here. Rather than going out into the world to proclaim Christ's kingdom. And because of that, our society and our world has no cause whatsoever for offense. And if you want to know just a little bit of a picture of that, then we we certainly saw that during COVID, didn't we? When a few churches were were given a spokesman and a medium where he was able to, to declare to the nations, in fact, that the government did not have the right to regulate worship in the church. We saw how hostily the government responded to that. And in fact, the governments said, and this was around the world, governors, presidents, the rest, oh yeah, really, (laughs) watch the authority that we have over the church. The message that Christ rules his church really ruffled their feathers. That was just the first little bit of an examination of maybe where we've been in our comfort for so long that we were extremely uncomfortable when all of a sudden the church was called to take a stand for something, something biblical. But we would much rather be disengaged for the sake of self-preservation. And a lot of cults have been born of that, that kind of mentality, including Catholicism actually. We've been called to disengage with the world. In fact, that was one of the causes for tremendous offense in the 18th century because for centuries Rome had established the tradition, a strong tradition, where the purest saints, the most spiritual saints, were the ones who withdrew from societies, right? They lived in monasteries. They didn't engage with the culture, the society, or the world around them. And that was also true of the Quakers, who who also then said that, well, any kind of participation in combat, not only did they say that that is murder, despite the fact that there's quite a lot of combat that God called the people of Israel to judicially enact in Old Testament Israel, but... They also said that that was a kind of engagement, a participation, a fellowship, a friendship with the world that ought not to describe God's people. Again, that, that was a cult that grossly misunderstood what James is saying in James 4.4. 4. And of course, we're all familiar with the Pennsylvania Amish, and both the Quakers and the Amish were cultist, cultic sects that had spun off of the Reformation that eventually entirely deserted the true gospel and exchanged them for a gospel of law, which is an anathema one. You remember what we looked at in Galatians chapter 1. For the Quakers, your salvation came through some kind of mystic experience, almost Gnostic-like. And you had to generate sort of this euphoric state of emotion in order to be saved. That was a work. Likewise, now in the Amish religious system, your spirituality, the test of being, uh, well, I guess, 
German or non-English or uh, within their church is a matter of separation and moral virtue, but it is not in any way a gospel of grace. They deserted the true gospel because they believed that it was what was outside of a man that defiled a man rather than what comes out of him. But of all the colonists in 18th century America, again, this, was, this is why the Puritans were so offensive. The Puritan Christians distinguished themselves as the ones most engaged in all levels of society. The Puritans, we know, have a really bad rap. They got bad press because of the media. It's really unfortunate. There's an outstanding book that I've been reading actually on the Puritans called Worldly Saints. We'll get to that idea a little bit later. It'll probably be one of our books of the month in the near future. But though we might not agree with every jot and tittle that the Puritans talked about, one of the things that we can be sure of is that they were incredibly and encouragingly thoughtful about corporate worship and about their engagement with the world. Everything they did. They wanted to ensure that it was biblical, thoughtful, that ultimately brought glory to God. And so the Puritans, setting themselves apart and distinguishing themselves from Catholicism, that was of course predominant in the 18th century, they distinguished themselves by their proactive engagement rather than withdrawal from society, especially amongst their more educated class, the pastoral class, the bishopric we might call them, or overseers to use um, a more modern English term, as opposed to Catholicism where the educated or religious or the hierarchy or priesthood or bishopry would withdraw into these monasteries. But John Withrop, when one Puritan said that we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill The eyes of all people are upon us. William Tyndale, likewise. Not a Puritan, but a pre-Puritan, you might say. He's often been called a pre-reformer, but he is certainly a pre-reformer and a pre-Puritan. He said that neighbor is a word of love. And in the same vein, it was Richard Sibbs who said that when once we are in Christ, we live for others, not for ourselves. And it might surprise us that they were so concerned about the drift towards isolationism that in 1636, this is kind of weird, Connecticut passed a law that said, no young man that is neither married nor hath any servant shall keep house by himself. Then, in the years between 1669 or between 1667 and 1669, Massachusetts took civil action against 60 people for living alone. Now, obviously, that's quite a bit extreme, and we would gawk at that, and we would readily and rather quickly say, okay, so that's one of those areas that we probably disagree with the Puritans on. Well, not even probably. We do. But we have to realize the context when those laws were written. To live alone was a deliberate disengagement with society and the world around you. That was the problem. It wasn't so much that you were living alone. It was why you were living alone and what that meant and how that threatened the community at large. It was a refusal to participate and engage with your community and your neighbor. And it threatened civic society as a whole. So you want the the modern convention of that then we would look to the 35-year-old millennial who still is jobless, racked up with student debt, and playing video games in their parents' basement. And you hear those things and are reading those stories and sometimes even those 35-year-old millennials suing their parents when their parents throw them out of the house because they won't get a job and they're racked up student debt and they just want to play video games all day. And we think there's a problem here with that. So... Maybe, maybe if we lived in an age where that kind of behavior actually threatened the survival of a community, we would consider passing a law that would banish that kind of a thing too. And then 200 years later, maybe Christians afterward would go, wow, that seemed a little bit of extreme, of an extreme thing rather. 
Well, maybe not. Again, if you understood how that threatened the community as a whole at the age. The issue, again, the issue, again, was about the kind of selfish disengagement with the world. When, as believers, we've been called to go out into the world, to pursue the hearts of men, to challenge them, to convict them of sin because we're articulating the truth of God's word and it cuts deep and demands a verdict. So like Richard Sibbs, William Perkins said, the real problem that we're dealing with here is a man who lives for himself. And when we look at what James means by friendship with the world, that is really what he's talking about. He's talking about a kind of world view that you have bought into that disregards the will of God and instead lives for yourself. It's a selfish, self-centered orientation. And we actually get a clue of it in verse 6. God is opposed to the proud. It sounds like maybe this otherwise doesn't really fit, but ultimately we understand that selfishness is pride. Pride makes us live for ourselves, serve ourselves, disregard our neighbor, and conversely, we are not called to be proud. We are called to be humble. We are called to be servants. We are Christ's slaves. We are not friends of the world. We submit ourselves, therefore, to God. And if you are prideful, if you buy into the world's lies and its schemes and its worldviews, then the natural inherent meaning of that is that you are an enemy of God. You cannot coexist. It's not an impossibility. It's not a possibility, rather. We can't soft pedal by any means what James is after. Once again, we look at verse 4. and Since chapter 1, how has James consistently addressed these believers? He calls them brothers. He calls them brothers. Even when encouraging them, he calls them brothers. When admonishing them, he calls them brothers. When correcting them, he calls them brothers. And he's extraordinarily and notoriously gracious and patient and kind. But imagine yourself to be in the congregation and you keep hearing brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, brothers, 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 brothers. And then you're in the congregation, you're listening to the elder read these words, and then all of a sudden you're called an adulteress. We talked about how egregiously offensive that was, and it really is. It's an identification, and it's an accusation. It draws imagery from Old Testament Israel's when she played the harlot, especially in Hosea, and Jeremiah, and Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Listen, for instance, how Isaiah puts it. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 2, He enters into peace, they rest in their beds, each one who walked in his upright way. But come here, you sons of a sorceress, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute. Against whom do you jest? Against whom do you open wide your mouth and stick out your tongue? Are you not children of rebellion, offspring of deceit, who inflame yourselves among the oaks under every luxuriant tree, who slaughter the children in the ravines under the clefts of the crags? And then verse 8, behind the door and the doorpost, you have set up your sign. Indeed, far removed from me, you have uncovered yourself and have gone up and made your bed wide. And you have made an agreement for yourself with them. You have loved their bed. You have looked on their manhood. It's not often that that gets read in church. It's a pretty graphic imagery of the adulteress. Isaiah doesn't mince words. Actually, Isaiah is merely recording the words that God says to his people in Israel for their spiritual harlotry. And James encompasses all of that when he now calls 
the people that he previously called brothers, adulteresses. Hey, you who've uncovered yourself and have looked on the manhood of your lovers. Man, you talk about offensive. You talk about direct. You talk about the kind of preaching that maybe would get a 21st century preacher fired. He talks to his people like that. James has apostolic authority here, and there's a lot that is at stake. So, once again, it's been a little while. It's been over a month since we've been in James. But when we think about the issue that would provoke him to speak in such terms, what, what is the issue that James just addressed before we got to verse 4? And it's okay, you can cheat, you can look at verse 1. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Quarrels and conflicts among the people of God. And more broadly than that, their living doesn't correspond with their faith, and that's a real problem. So the immediate, the immediate context is quarrels and conflicts in the people of God. Why? Because your pleasures, because your pleasures are waging war with your members. You lust and you don't have, so you commit murder. In other words, you are operating under a pagan worldview. You are living for yourself and not for God. You've bought into the world's system. You've bought into the world's lies. More broadly speaking, more broadly speaking, you aren't living in correspondence with your faith. You fear. You have anxiety. You've not been faithful. You've played the harlot. And it questions the authenticity of their justification, whether they have truly experienced regeneration. They're not walking in wisdom. They're not living in reality of the kingdom. They're not living in reality of what they profess to believe. And so they are, it's appropriate that they be called adulteresses. There's no middle ground here. Once again, their worldview, their orientation has become entirely corrupt. And, and now they look a lot more like the enemies of the cross rather than the children of God. And what is their problem then, broadly and specifically? Why do they look like the world, broadly speaking? And why the conflicts and quarrels specifically? Now beginning in verse 4, James gives us the diagnosis and then he gives us the cure. So if you were looking for an outline today, that can be your outline. James gives us a diagnosis for the source of conflicts and selfish living in verse 4, the diagnosis, and then the cure in verses 5 through 7, the diagnosis or the cause of their adultery, and then the cure for their adultery. Now let's look at this diagnosis, verse 4. Again, so immediately we're struck with this idea, this misunderstood, often misunderstood idea of friendship with the world. And, and we have to understand that we can tend to use the word friend rather trivially <laughs> and rather lightly today, or even as a matter of cordiality, as a friendly greeting. Um, maybe you finish a business meeting and you even uh, leave the business meeting on good terms, and you say, well, thank you, friend. What do you mean, friend? You have nothing to do with me. We've never met before. We had a half an hour conversation, and now we just agreed to some kind of a business agreement. That's all, but I don't even know your wife's name. But we use the word friend as a friendly greeting, or we use friend as a matter of cordiality. You don't even have to be an acquaintance with a friend. It could just be a matter of a, a partnership, or they have to be in your network, or a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, you know, on Facebook. A friend in this context doesn't have the same meaning at all. It's the noun philia, the verb you've often heard, phileo, translated as love in the New Testament. Greater love has no one than this, than he lays down his life for his friend, Jesus said. You know what kind of love that was? That was phileo love. 
Greater love has no one than this. And so this kind of friendship, the, the kind of friendship that is associated with brotherly love is what James is after here. How do you have brotherly love? How do you have fellowship with the world? That's not possible while claiming to have fellowship with God. To be a friend in the first century was, was someone who was bound to you, somebody who had a, a mutual and per, purposeful interest in each other because you may as well be a brother. So in much the same way that in the church we call one another brother or, or sister, it's a very exclusive term, isn't it? When we say brother or sister, it's a very exclusive term. It's a careful term. It's a guarded and selectively used term. It's a precise term. You know, sometimes maybe you get used to the vernacular in the church, calling somebody brother or sister. Thanks, brother. And we love to hear that in the community of Christ. But then you go out into the world, and then there's somebody that maybe you've been evangelizing even, and then you leave the meeting and you say, thanks, brother. And you go, oh, no. Why? At least you should if you realize that you did it. No, no, no. Because you know that they are not your brother. It's kind of been a little bit neutered in, in pop culture. You know, we don't say brother, we say bro. But, no, we have these terms that are guarded and selective. They, they demonstrate a particular kind of koinonia, a kind of fellowship, a camaraderie, a one another that we have together in Christ. And the word friend in the New Testament is also used exclusively and consistently with the same idea. And so just as it would be inappropriate for you to call yourself a brother of an unbeliever, it would be inappropriate for you to refer to an unbeliever as a friend in this same kind of phileo sense. Friend is a synonym of brother. That's how James is using it. This is someone who has has an invested and shared worldview with you. They are like-minded. They have the same interest, same goal. You're pursuing the same end. So back in James 2.23, when James reminds us that by Abraham's belief, he was a friend of God, what he's saying is that he had an intimate fellowship with God. He was invested in God's purposes and God's calling. Why? How does that happen? Verse 7. He submitted to God. He came under God's direction, God's truth. He adopted an exclusively biblical worldview or wise way of living. He agreed with the mission. He esteemed what God esteemed and loved what God loves. His message was God's message. He valued what God valued. And so you understand that in that sense, there is no way that we can say that we are a friend of the world. Because the world doesn't value what we value. The world's mission isn't our mission. And the world's message is not our message. But unfortunately, rather than seeing the significance and importance of what James is saying, we often trivialize it, actually, and and make it a matter of external law rather than considering the reality of the heart that he's after. And so, we believe that he's he's talking about maybe a a kind of isolationism. Don't be a friend of the world. Well, you shouldn't have relationships with the world. But you remember that Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, that is Jesus' disciples, but to keep them from the evil one. So we recognize that we are in the world. The issue is that we are not of the world. But unfortunately, it's become virtuous even that the goal of Christian living is to isolate and insulate and become an island. So much so that when they really think about it, they realize that they don't have a single meaningful relationship with an unbeliever outside of perhaps their family. Name five, not related to you. Even the idea of having an unbeliever in their home immediately starts to fill up a sense of anxiety. Invite an unbeliever to my home. 
I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what we would talk about. I don't know. The gospel. Demonstrate a biblical worldview to them. It's, it's not hard. The problem is that we are embarrassed about the gospel. And we are afraid of what the world might do to us. Book after book has been written to suggest even the, uh, this is ultimately how the church protects itself in the world and even the goal of Christian parenting is to keep children out of the world. That's not true. No, we are preparing them to go out into the world, aren't we? But in fact, it's become the modus operandi of parenthood to keep children under the tutelage of the parent, even after they're married. There's no two that become one flesh. And they're woefully ill-equipped then to go out into the world. Our objective as parents is not to keep children out of the world. In fact, but that philosophy doesn't consider the danger that for lack of genuine people of the world are knowing and having relationships with genuine real people of the world, people they know, people that they can name, their children might grow up to be indifferent to the world that they've never engaged in and are quite content then to live in an environment where they never have to have a meaningful relationship with an unbeliever. But did you know, this is what's cool, this is what I I thought was, well, would have thought was really cool if I had known it as a young man. And it's not a fault of anyone but my own. So one, Psalm 127 says, boys, you can write this down. Our children are arrows in the hands of a warrior. Who's the warrior? The faithful father. Children are arrows in the hands of the warrior. How blessed the man whose quiver is full of them. But the purpose and philosophy of parenting has become keep them in the quiver. That's not what an arrow is for. I like how Tom Askell put it. He reminds us in the book, Strong and Courageous, which may also be a book of the month in the future, that arrows are for battle, and they haven't done their job until they're covered in blood and broken. Your job as a parent is to hone the tip and fling the arrow into the heart of the enemy and your child is bloodied and broken. Because they were faithful to the task that you entrusted them with as well. And the job is no different in the life of the church, folks. This is what we do. When we understand the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, this is exactly what Jesus said. We are called to teach, to baptize, and to go. And going is the presupposition, it's the assumption, it describes all the manner of the teaching and baptizing, going out into the, all the world, proclaiming the, the gospel. I assume that's the wind. Anyway, our job, our job is to make sure our children are straight and honed, so that when they are, they are sent through the air they find the heart of their target with effect. They will not be ashamed when they, that is the arrows, speak with their enemies in the gates. Psalm 127.5. They've been well equipped. And that means that you must teach them biblical wisdom. They must understand the philosophies of the world and how they threaten and overthrow the kingdom of God or try to. And so, not only are we prone to congregational isolationism, but we're also prone to familial isolationism, not born out of a desire to train the next generation of children to be soldiers for Christ. And all of us have been equipped with the stewardship to train the next generation to be soldiers for Christ. But it's been said that an authentic Christianity assumes a purposeful worldly sainthood. Purposeful worldly sainthood. That's probably not a term that 
we're very familiar with today, but it was a term that was well understood by the Puritans who we introduced ourselves to when we're talking about this idea of worldly saints. That sounds like an oxymoron to us. It's a contradiction at face value, a contradiction at terms. How, do you, how can you be a worldly saint? Well, it's not talking about worldly as in a, a sinful system, or participation in wickedness and debauchery and all those kinds of things. It's talking about a kind of thoughtful engagement with the world. Meant the, in the pursuit to live life for the glory of God, they're utterly setting themselves apart for the purpose of God, having been set apart for the purposes of God, while meaningfully and thoughtfully engaging with the lost. But that engagement is purposeful, it's uncompromising, it's, it's holy, again, it's set apart. It was a recognition that as Christians, we have to discern the line between cultural gluttony and cultural anorexia. There is a spiritual danger to the former and there is a spiritual danger to the latter. And one often overreacts to the other. But our aspiration is to be like our Lord. How many times did Jesus eat with Pharisees? I know you thought I was going to say sinners and tax collectors. How many times did Jesus say Pharisee, eat with Pharisees? That we know of three in the Gospel of Luke. None of them ended well. But he also ate with sinners and tax collectors, didn't he? He was a serial diner with sinners and tax collectors. And that was also especially offensive to the Pharisees. Many of them, in fact, Mark chapter 2, verse 15 tells us, when Jesus called Matthew to follow him, Matthew invites Jesus to his home for a massive dinner party. You know what that looked like? Looked like every one of his other dinner parties. Who were Matthew's friends? This was an event. Masses of people here are dining with Jesus, and it was a formal event as well. It wasn't mere happenstance that Jesus is here, or that Matthew is here, or that Matthew's friends are here. This is a private luncheon where a bunch of rowdy sinners are kind of invite, invite themselves to join their table. And so Jesus is kind of like, you know, increasingly uncomfortable. You're sitting too close. I didn't know you were going to be here. And uh, yeah, there were, there were tables in the first century, in case you were wondering. Um, that scene in that movie, it was one of the many movies. Uh, there was uh, one of those films by that actor. I can't remember his name either. But anyway, in the scene, it kind of humorously depicted Jesus as the inventor of tables and chairs. And Mary says, Jesus, I don't think this is ever going to catch on. But actually, they already had tables and chairs in the first century. Um, but they were for informal use. It was like a breakfast nook, right? You, you don't typically uh, have fine dining in the breakfast nook. It's for everyday use. Or it would be like having breakfast uh, around your, um, maybe your um, thing. Your island. That was the word I was looking for. It, it's, it's in my notes. I just can't find it in my notes. <laughs> but... These, these, uh, these declining, to, to, to be declining at dinner was, was a matter of abnormality. It was, it was a special occasion. It was a distinct occasion. It was usually a formal occasion of some kind. And so this is a well-prepared, thought-out feast that Matthew has Jesus come to. And we know that because Jesus is reclining. And so that's like, eating in a dining room, but this is, this is a classy event, but it's a party. This is not normally where we might expect to see Jesus, and that's why the Pharisees are themselves so offended. These are a bunch of pagan sinners and tax collectors. What in the world is he doing with them? How can he get caught up in that crowd, right? This is friendship with the world as far as the Pharisees were concerned, except we know that it wasn't. I mean, these people were so base that they weren't even allowed in the synagogue. They would never, the Pharisees would never be caught speaking with them unless they were lying to them, in which case the Talmud said it was considered to be honorable. Let alone dining with them. 
Talmud also considered tax collectors as vile, as thieves and murderers. As far as the Jews were concerned in the first century, there were Ninevites in the flesh. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, noted for its ruthless inhabitants and notorious for their brutality. They boasted in the mass genocides of their enemies and the mutilization, the torture, the dismemberment of their captors. So this is a rough crowd. A well-to-do, but a rough crowd. And then you also remember that Jesus took the initiative to invite himself to one of these things in Jericho, of all places, where Jews weren't supposed to live anyway. He invites himself to a home in a city that God declared to Israel, you are not to inhabit it because it is cursed by God. Do you remember when Jesus passes through Jericho in Luke chapter 19? Every child knows this story. He calls out to a man named Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And boy, folks really didn't like that. The, The crowds began to grumble and complain, verse 7 says. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And now listen, this isn't just another ordinary tax collector here. This, he's not just a, a sinner and a thug. I mean, he is those things. This was the mob boss. He ran the town. This was scandalous. This would be like going to have dinner with the old man Russ Buffalino. Remember him? No, true story. That's who Zacchaeus is. I like the way one person put it, though. The frowns of a few do not matter when a soul's eternal destiny is on the line. But don't miss it. This is what is so important. Because this sets the parameters and the context for our relationship with those in the world. Jesus Jesus had a purpose, didn't he? There's a purpose. Earlier, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, I wrote to you, my letters do not associate with immoral people. But it did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers, or with the idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he is an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside God judges? Remove the wicked man from among yourselves." You separate yourself from the world. How can you go out as a laborer into the harvest? So that's not what James is saying when he says that we are not to be friends with the world and friendship with the world is to be an enemy of God. He's not saying you can't have relationships with the people, with unbelievers in the world. We are the salt of the earth and we are not called to hide the light under a bushel. or to hide it within the confines of these walls. Going out into the world with a purpose is not what it means to have friendship with them, with phileo, with them. That's not hostility towards God. So what does it mean? What What is James getting after here? Well, we understand that there is an important purpose in the church to equip the saints. Um, my clock was upside down, so I thought I had like 50 minutes left. Maybe we'll just get to what it doesn't mean and what it does mean. We'll see what happens here. What does James mean when he says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That doesn't mean that we can't have friends 
with unbelievers. Deliberate friends, strategic friends, friends that we are communicating the gospel with, who know who we are, that we are calling to repent. First of all, we need to understand the purpose and the ministry of the church. It is so important. It is so important to equip the saints for the work of service. It is so important for the church to hold one another accountable in love because it is a dangerous work we do. It is an important work of the church to teach and admonish. Why? So that you know the truth and so that others are holding you accountable to the truth. The enemy is assaulting us from all directions with the philosophies and the lies of the world. And it is extraordinarily easy for us to become so engaged with the world that we've lost our sensitivity to it as well. So you can lose your sensitivity to the world because you've become isolationists, and you can also lose your, insens- your sensitivity rather to the world because you yourself have become a friend of the world in the way that James is talking about. You are living with the world. You've bought into the world system. You prioritize the world. You're more concerned about the world. And you know that because your life is not demonstrating a commitment to the Lord's people in the church. And so the danger is that we are completely ignorant of the ways that the world begins then to change the way we think. Because you're not connected to the body of believers. And it's always subtle. And so you lose your sense of purpose. The very reason why you are here. You don't fear because you comfortably coexist. You have no direction, no purpose, no mission, no target. You don't mind being released from the bowstring because you're not being fired anywhere. Just into the air. And so you've, you become directionless and like a ship without a rudder and you're in danger, hiding the light under a bushel as well. You have drifted into a windless sea This is the catastrophe of compromise. That's what friendship with the world is. Compromising convictions. By the way, we've been learning about this at High Point Classical Academy in chapel. Courage, courage comes from conviction. And conviction comes from knowing the truth. But when you become directionless, when you've drifted into a windless sea, when you become a friend of the world, you have become convictionless. You have no courage. You are an arrow without effect. It's catastrophe. One person said that we've been called to be the salt of the earth, not its sugar, but that's what you become. Too long we've been trying to sugarcoat a message of foolishness with the wrong stuff and it's offensive to the one who prepared it. And we ineffectively feed the world a steady, dedicate, a steady diet of superficial, empty calories. And the reason why we compromise our integrity when pursuing the world is because we have become friends with the world in this intimate sense. We become adulterers. It means we have bought into the world view of the world. They define what we pursue. And that's why their worldview no longer offends us or that we've come to accept it. And because it no longer offends us or it no longer affects us, we are convictionless and we don't speak the truth. They define the truth and we let them. And they also likewise define what we pursue because we bought into their system, their lies. 
the pursuit of life, your purpose in life, your satisfaction in life, your worth and value in life is meritorious rather than grace. It's self-promoting rather than humble. It's acquisitive rather than sacrificial. Your value and your feeling of self-importance is based on the things that you do, the degrees you earn, the money you make, the business you acquire, the relationships you have, the things that you've acquired. Your value and importance is based on what you've gained in life. And so you, ha- you can show your success, your value, your contribution to society is about the rotary clubs you join, the clothes you wear, the cars you own, the homes you have, the vacations you take. That's what defines you. It's what distinguishes you. It's what sets you apart from everybody else in the world. You've bought into it. And that's what gives you joy. In a word, it's selfish ambition. And so binding yourself together with that ambition, the ambition of the world that ultimately seeks to overthrow the throne of God so that it can pursue its own ambition in its selfishness rather than submitting itself to God will result in being an enemy of God. It is is antithetical to living with the purposes of God. Our ambition is to serve Christ and his kingdom. We can easily defect. We can quickly defect. And these brothers of James quickly defected. So, that's the problem. That's the diagnosis. Why are they adulteresses? Because they bought into the world's lies. They didn't hold fast the faithful words that they had been given. They didn't guard their hearts. They didn't sharpen the arrows in their quivers. Nor did they fling them to effect, but just took a wild shot in the darkness. The battle's over here, folks. What are we doing hiding under a bushel? What is the solution then? What is the solution? Verse 5 is a very difficult verse to translate, actually. Uh, It's difficult to discern what the subject is. The subject is supplied if you have the NAS. He jealously desires a spirit which he has made to dwell in us. The pronoun he isn't there in the original language. Nor is spirit capitalized in the original language. In the original language, nothing in Greek was actually capitalized unless it was the beginning of a paragraph or a formal name, something to that effect. But pneuma would never be capitalized. So we have to discern, is it talking about man's spirit or God's spirit? And the King James says that the spirit dwelleth in us, lusteth to envy. It's hard to speak in Shakespearean English, but nevertheless, the, the point is poignant. And I think the, the King James actually does a better job translating the text here because though God is a jealous God who desires your uncompromised service to him, the word that's being used of envy is never used in a positive sense in either Greek texts, secular Greek texts, or in biblical texts. Never is God said to actually envy. He is a jealous God, but this particular word for envy always has a negative connotation. So it seems better to understand this as saying, you, your spirit, the spirit that lives in you, enviously lusts. That's who you are. That's why you're an adulteress. That's why you're pursuing their lies, their worldviews. That's why you're buying into their system. And that's why God needs to give greater grace. You buy into their system, you're proud. 
You think you can be justified by works of the law? You're proud. You don't need God's grace. You're proud. And God is opposed to the proud. You are his enemy, but he gives grace to who? The humble. The humble one isn't a friend of the world. The world hates the humble because the poor in spirit have conviction. The poor in spirit will confront them in their sin, but theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, so, what is the answer? What is the ultimate answer? This is it in verse 7. Submit, therefore, to God. That's what all of us must do. There's a newsflash for the 21st century. We don't have truth. We don't define truth. The lies that we believe in are just that. But oftentimes we define our own experiences, our own worldviews, our own thoughts, our own presuppositions as the truth. And therefore we think whatever we want about God, we think whatever we want about the gospel, we think whatever we want about the church, we think of whatever we want about the people in the world. We think all, anything we want about our purpose in life, pursue what we want in life without consideration for what God wants, what God desires. We are not humble. We are submitting to the world's worldview because we're born in sin. We've been commanded then, and remember the gospel is always a command, We've been commanded to submit, therefore, to God. Submit to His truth, the truth that He has revealed to us in Scripture, that men everywhere must repent. So, mark it down. If you write in your Bibles, when James says, submit, therefore, to God, this is a command to repent. Repent. Turn away from your sin and to God. The world says you don't need to. But your sin is an affront to a holy God. You must be reconciled to him through the righteousness of Jesus Christ credited to you by faith so that you can be forgiven your sins. That requires humility to recognize that you can't earn favor with God Service to yourself will never provide you with any eternal security. It will never bring forgiveness. Your works will never please God. They will never outweigh the wrong you've done. You stand condemned, but in humility you recognize your need for a Savior, so you submit to Him, you trust Him for your salvation and that he will keep you till the day that Christ comes. Let's close in prayer. Father, we are grateful for how powerful and direct your word is, how, how as believers even, it, it cuts so deeply into even still our fleshly desires it offends us even at times. It is so direct. But we, we, we rejoice in its clarity so that we can respond to it with humility and joy and rejoice that you have made a way of provision for us to be reconciled to you. And we thank you for the holy calling that you have called us to live, set apart once again from the world and to God, and may the world recognize that we are not like them. We have been given a stewardship, and we'll carry that stewardship. Confront the world in its sin, and we will meet the enemy with the power of your word. 
we will carefully, selectively fire the arrows in our quiver with effect so that you can work your word in them. And we trust all these things to you and we pray that you would also preserve and protect us in the dangerous work that you have called us to. May we never compromise our convictions. May we live courageously before you. And Father, we are thankful that you call us friends.